on my pillow as my heart began to pray. I thought of my blessed Lord so kind. You know, I asked him to keep me safe until the break of day. And then I got up with heaven on my mind. Oh, Hi there, I'm Chuck Cooper, host of It's a God Thing radio program, which is heard 24-7 right here on www.itsagodthingradio.com. For the next several weeks, we will feature a Bible-based series on heaven, which is presented by Dr. Fred Lodge, Senior Pastor at First Baptist Church in Blairsville, Georgia. Got a question for you. Have you ever wondered what will happen to you when you die? Ever wondered if heaven and hell are for real? Want to know what heaven is like or where it is, what you'll do there? Or how to make sure you'll get there? Well, I've got some great news for you. Bible-based answers to those questions and others, and many of the fairy tale myths circulating, will be debunked in this enlightening series. Here now is episode number two, Cosmology. Welcome back as we're looking for a place that we long for, but we've never been to. A place that we dream of and we only have glimpses of. But what a wonderful place for us to be in looking for and longing for heaven. I'm not putting you off, but I think there has to be some foundation laid before we can really mine the deepest tunnels of the truth about what heaven is all about. So there's a list of words you and I need to get in our mind to understand what they mean, what these places are, and how they're described in in the Word of God. Words not only like heaven, but the pit, hell, Abaddon, Sheol, paradise, Hades, Apollyon. Tartarus, and Lake of Fire. These are our words, biblical words, names of places, and yet where do they fit in to our study of heaven? And each of them does. I want to teach you a word, one that, that you may not know. It is the word cosmology. Uh, that's different from cosmetology. Okay, I may need a little bit of that, but hey, too many of you agreed too quick. <laughs> Cosmology is that study of the heavens, study of especially how earth relates to uh, the heavens. Now, in biblical times, uh, both Old Testament and New Testament, you had the concept of three heavens. The first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven, okay? The, the first heaven is the sky. That's where you see the birds uh, flying up, up in, that's, that's the first heaven. The second heaven, the way the scripture speaks of it, is is where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. All the celestial bodies made up the second heaven. And then the third heaven was the abode of God. And you'll remember Paul was talking about he knew a man and, and he had been taken up into the third heaven. He was talking about himself and seeing things he was not allowed to share. Well, I, I want to take these various terms of, of heaven and hell, the various places that, that men and women go after death, okay? We want to take these, and, and I, I'm going to plot this out on a line for you as we go. They'll be bringing these, uh, these illustrations up on the overhead here as we're ready for them and as I tell them. Uh, here's the thing. As I shared last week, we suffer from concepts that come from the world and not from the scriptures, as it relates to heaven, to hell, and all of the other words that I mentioned a few moments ago. We need a biblical understanding of these places, and not to allow our ideas and concepts to be formed by any other source, okay? There's well-meaning Bible teachers, well-meaning preachers, uh, well-meaning authors, uh, and, and, and then you have Oprah and all of her crowd, too, who are telling you all about this. But what we need to ask is, what does the Bible say about these places? Throughout the Bible, you have, and especially even in the Old Testament, you have a clear teaching that there is an afterlife. Now, the Old Testament doesn't give as clear a picture of it, as the New Testament does, but even a lot of the New Testament leaves a lot for us to to wait to understand. But that there was a place where we gather ourselves together after death is very clear. Abraham in Genesis 25, it says he died and he was gathered to his people. Jacob in Genesis 49, 29, I will be gathered to my people. 
Later, David will say in 2 Samuel 12, 28, about his, his son that had died. He said, he will not re return to me, but I will go to be with him. So there was this concept in the Old Testament that there is, there is a realm of the dead, a conscious realm of the dead that people go to after they're saved. It's not real abundantly clear, the separation between the righteous and the wicked. There was just a place. That place in the old Hebrew tongue is known as Sheol. In the Greek, the, the Greek word for that, the Greek translation of that, is Hades. Okay, we'll get into this a little bit more in just a few moments. But it was a place, a realm of the dead. Now, when you get to the New Testament, you have some greater clarity. Paul talked about going up into the third heaven, saw things that he was not allowed to share. But uh, Stephen, in Acts 7, 55, 56... It says, but he, Stephen, he being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. There are, in the New Testament, we have folks that are allowed to see glimpses. And then we have one person that is allowed to spend a great deal of time gazing into the portals of heaven, and that is the Apostle John. Okay, John uh, in the book of Revelation gives an extended look as to what we're going to see in heaven. We're going to quote very uh, considerably about that. So first of all, uh, we might not know everything they need to know about the afterlife. But let me tell you this. God always knows where his people are, both now and in the afterlife. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as not some who have no hope. God knows exactly where our loved ones, where his loved ones are. And he wants you to know the destiny of those who have gone on before us and that we can long to not only be with them, but to be with them where they are, to be with them where they are with the Lord. And that is the central key. The second thing I want you to do, turn over to John 14. I want, you to, I want you to look at John 14, 2 through 4 in a way maybe you haven't looked at before. But I want you to, to grasp a, a, a deep truth that brings to bear and really sets some interesting ground rules in what we're looking at. John 14, 2. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Some translation says many rooms, okay? If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is this place that he is preparing for us? Well, the scriptures elucidate on that, and that's really heaven. Here's something I want you to grasp. Hold on tight. Heaven is not ready yet. Heaven is still under construction. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know, I, know, I know my mama and my daddy, they went to heaven. They went to be with Jesus. In a few minutes, we're going to see where they are. But heaven is where they're going to be. Heaven is under construction. Still is until this day. But John says that he was looking. He saw this new heaven and this new earth descending out of the heavens to the earth. It's still up there. It's still being in the construction phase right now. But it's where Jesus is. Now, just hold on to that for a moment. What can we know according to the Word of God? What can we know about the place, the, the, the abode where people go after they die. Well, Jesus did not leave us to just speculate. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. And beginning in verse 22, we have not a parable, but Jesus giving some very explicit teachings. I say it's not a parable. Sometimes it's included in a list of parables. But a parable is a teaching story. Nowhere in any parable that Jesus ever taught does he name specific particular people and their destiny. Here he's naming names. He's naming names of people that those who are hearing him would know. All right? That's important. This is a teaching, but it's not a parable. Okay? Let's read what it says beginning in verse 22. So it, so it was that, that the beggar died, uh, Lazarus died, and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, now remember Hades is the Greek 
interpretation of the word Sheol. He lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, look at this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who would want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, what we have described here is a strange place to most of us. It's one place. But there are godly people, and they're ungodly. And somehow there's a gulf that separates them. And we see that the godly are receiving some of their rewards, and the evil are receiving some of their torment. But it's not in its complete form yet. Let's look. What, 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 can, we, what can we learn about this? Put up, uh, put up the next slide, if you will, for the first slide for me, if you will, please. This is, this is life on earth until death. But then we're going to see, put up the next one. What happens next? Give me that next slide, if you will, please. What can we know about where people go when they die? What can we learn about this realm of the dead from these verses? Well, let's look. There's, there's, there's nine clear things that we can know. Both Lazarus, a very real person whom people knew by name, and this rich man who everybody knew, he just didn't use his name for whatever reason, they both lived on after death. There's life after death. That's the first thing that we can grant from this. Second, they both maintain their very unique personalities. Lazarus was still Lazarus. Rich man was still a rich man. It was still the same people. Third, they are both spoken of as having physical attributes. Finger, tongue, physical attributes. Okay? Fourth, there is this fixed separation between them. Fifth, they're totally conscious of their past, their present, and their future. Six, they're totally aware of where they are. Seven, both begin to experience the rewards or punishment resulting from the decisions they've made in their lives. Eight, both are conscious of the fate of their loved one who are still alive. And finally, they're both aware of the finality of where they are right now. Now, what I want to do, I want to talk about these two places. I want to talk about this immediate abode of those who are lost and this immediate abode of those who are righteous, who are saved. But first I want to talk about the place of the unrighteous. We got it. We got to deal with that before we can go on. There is this place that is referred to as Sheol in the Hebrew and Hades in the Greek where the unrighteous go at death. It's not their eventual place. This is not where they're going to spend all eternity. But here in, in this passage, we have this general realm of the dead clearly being separated between the righteous and the ungodly. No traveling back and forth between. And yet there's at least awareness but from the wicked side of what's going on in heaven. We're not really told there's clear understanding that Lazarus has of the rich man, but we are very clearly seen here that part of the torment is seeing what's going on in that part of, of Hades where the righteous are. That Greek word Hades is used 12 times, excuse me, 10 times in the New Testament. Every time it's used, it's the, just simply the abode of the dead. It's not clearly delineated between the righteous or the unrighteous, okay? And there are other references to it in Revelation 6 about the pale horse that comes riding. Uh, it appears to be the physical death and, and Hades, the realm of the dead, are following after them. Later in Revelation 20, it talks about death and Hades giving up their dead and then both death and Hades being cast into the lake of fire. We'll get to that in a few moments. 
So what John is saying is that the grave someday will give up the bodies of the wicked. They will be resurrected in order to stand before the great white throne judgment. And I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll be there in just, just a few minutes. So we have this realm that sinners go that's referred to as Sheol or, or Hades specifically. Now, there's another word that is used only one time, and that's in 2 Peter 2. And that's the word Tartarus, T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S, Tartarus, Tartarus. And it's, it's uniquely used in this one place. And no matter where you read, in most evangelical commentators, they'll tell you this is where certain ones of the demonic host, the fallen angels, are kept until the end. Some of those we find know in Revelation will be released. Some of those this will be where they are until they are also placed into the lake of fire. So there is this place that's reserved uniquely for these fallen angels. Okay, And then another word that we need to be aware of, uh, especially because of the 12 times it's used, 11 of those times it's used on the lips of Jesus. And that is the word Gehenna. Gehenna. Gehenna actually is a literal physical place in this world right now, okay? On the south side of the old city of Jerusalem, the, the southern part, years and years ago, this is the, the valley where Molech was worshipped. This was a horrendous uh, Baal god that required uh, the sacrificial gift of babies, and people would bring their babies, the Baal idol uh, set with his arms like this. His, his belly would be heated up until he was almost red glowing. And they would cast their babies into the arms of this horrible god, Molech, to die. And this was how they showed their devotion to this Baal god. Well, under King Josiah, all of those idols were torn down. And this was turned into a garbage heap. Okay? And this is where uh, the garbage, garbage was dumped over the walls. This is where the fires were always burning to burn it up and, and to consume it. The bodies of the ungodly or criminals, they were thrown off over in there. And the fires were always burning. So as Jesus was looking for a place that he knew would spark the understanding and the imagination of people. When he wanted them to know what, what Hades, the evil part of Hades was like, he said, look to the valley of Hinnom. Look to Gehenna, where the fire is always burning and the worm is always uh, decaying. And that's a picture of what the eternal fate of the wicked would be. Today, it's really made into a quite beautiful park down below there. It's no longer the garbage uh, dump for Jerusalem. But we pass by there, and I point it out every time that I go. But I'm reminded of a, of, of a pastor who was there some years ago. Uh, you know, it doesn't snow much in Jerusalem. It does, but not, not nearly as often as we get it here. And uh, a pastor was over there, and he had his group, and uh, he woke up early one morning, and it was snowing like crazy. It was snowing like crazy. So he, he called his guy and says, get the bus ready. I want everybody to go right now. And he says, well, where do you want to go? He says, I want to show people the Valley of Hinnom. So they went there, they parked the bus, and he was showing everybody down there. He said, I want you to see what hell, I want you to look at this. Because deacons, you told me you'd give me a raise when hell freezes over. Now, there it is right there. <laughs> I don't know if he ever got his raise, but it sure was neat <laughs> to imagine it. And we have seen snow there in, in Hinnom before. Now, that, that's a word I want you to be aware of. I want you to, to be aware. But Jesus didn't use it as if it was a separate place, but used it to describe the awfulness of what hell, the lake of fire, would eventually be. Jesus says in Matthew 28, don't fear the one who is able, uh, fear the one rather that is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Okay, Matthew 23, 15, Jesus denounced the Pharisees. He said, you travel over land and sea to win one single convert, but when he becomes one, you make him twice the son of hell. That's another use uh, he has of Gehenna there. But it's a picture word. It's not the final word, Okay. One other place I want to talk to you about, and then we're going to move on to the good stuff, but you need to hear this. There's another place, and uniquely referred to by Jesus, uniquely referred to in Revelation. And this is the final resting place of the damned. This is the lake of fire. The lake of fire, okay? 
This, this is hell in full-blown glory, if you will. Revelation 19, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that were, had the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. And both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, along with the beast and false prophet. Verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, for murderers and sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death this is the the final culmination of all the the fate of those who are evil now there's an interesting scripture that also says that at right now hell is being enlarged uh, the the parameters of hell uh, enlarged uh, it, it's it's a building program you don't want to be a part of but all that about the 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 nasty side the lower side let's talk a little bit about where does the righteous go Okay, in the Old Testament tradition, these two partitions uh, were not given separate names. But Jesus came up with a phrase that is not used in any of the prophets or anywhere in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it's not where it's used anywhere else really in uh, the Bible except where it refers uh, here. Jesus was on the cross. And that one thief who dared to place faith in him, to him Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise paradise the word paradise actually is a, is a very old Persian word and it refers to the king's private garden a place of quiet a place of beauty uh, a place of peace Jesus said today you're going to be with me in paradise well, what is what is paradise paradise is where the believing person goes immediately upon death and the most distinguishing aspect of that place is it's with Jesus all right, heaven is still under construction. Paradise is where, technically where, those who believe in Christ go immediately upon their uh, death. If you look right here, you'll see that there's a star that is a single point between paradise and heaven which is under construction, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the single point that lives in both of those realms because he's overseeing the construction of heaven, the new heaven, and the new earth. And yet at the same time, he is with all of those who love him and are faithful to him. So technically, and I say on this technically, euphemistically you can say my loved ones are in heaven with Jesus. I'm not going to get on to you. I'm not going to correct you. But if we want to be precise in our terminology, they're in paradise with Jesus. Okay? And that is not yet heaven. Heaven is yet awaiting for each and every one of us. Uh, interestingly, both paradise and Hades or Sheol will give up what is in them. The scripture happens to tell us of two huge events that are going to take place. The great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. At that great white throne judgment, the, the dead that have died apart from Christ will be raised. They'll be take part of a resurrection as well. But they will be raised to stand before the great white throne judgment. Then, according to Revelation 19, 20, and 21, that is when the lost then are cast into that lake of fire. This is when even death itself is cast into the lake of fire. This is where Satan and all of his uh, demons are cast into the lake of fire. That is that forever place that is sealed and can never be open for all eternity. But then the righteous dead, their resurrection, they stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now our sins are not being judged there. Our sins have already been judged at the cross of Jesus Christ. But this is where we receive our reward. This is where we stand before Christ and give account of the things that we have done in the body. But then paradise itself is opened up and, or, or, or emptied out. And that's when the new heaven and the new earth comes down. And this gives us the eternal abode. This is the picture of the saints with Jesus in the new heaven on the new earth. Now we're going to have a lot to say about heaven and earth when it comes to this time, the new heaven and the new earth, because there's no real distinction between the two. It is heaven come down to the new earth. And then all of the evil are, are in the lake of fire. This is the eternal abode of the damned. 
Now, I want to say all this tonight. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time after this getting into what is life like right now in paradise? What is life going to be like in heaven? What's it going to be like on the new earth? All of these things we're going to get into. But it's important to have the cosmology right in our heads, first of all, to where then we can understand what we're talking about in, in, in the process, okay? Here's the key. Here's the most important thing. Here's what I want you to know more than anything else. I think all of you sitting in this room tonight are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. But folks, I want you to make your calling and election sure. I want you to know that you know that you know that heaven and the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth is your eternal home. It would break my heart to know that anyone I know will spend eternity separated from God and in that kind of a fiery place. That should motivate us. That should move us mightily to share with those that we love. They need to hear the gospel of Christ. They need to make their calling and election sure. So if you're not absolutely sure about that, let me encourage you to come and talk to me or Derek or Eric Van Pelt tonight. Let us just take you to the Word of God and, and share with you what the Word of God says to where you can have assurance. John wrote this. He said, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life and I want you to know that with every part of your being here tonight now that we got all this good stuff out of the way we're going to be talking a lot about what it's going to be like to live with Jesus beyond this life will you pray with me Father God all of these great songs that we sing about heaven begin to have their fruition now and it's such an incredible stark painful contrast the eternal destiny of the damned and the eternal destiny of the saved. This world we're living in, Lord, doesn't want to see this in such clear terms. This world we're living in wants to create some other place, or they want to make entry less restrictive, or whatever. What we build our cosmology on is what does the Bible say? What does the Scriptures make clear? There are a lot about heaven that we don't know yet, as Paul said, their eyes not seen or ear heard, and neither have it even entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. We know we've only got glimpses, but we can so see so much from those glimpses. Lord, I want us to be like Paul when he said, mm, for me to depart from Christ and be with him is so much better. So much better. Lord, I, I, I've come to learn there are those who will say that those people have their minds always on heaven or no earthly good. Well, it's quite to the contrary. Those who think the most about heaven are the most concerned about people here on planet earth. And they do the most to encourage them to avoid the pit and to find eternity in your arms. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't have the absolute assurance, will you please encourage them before they go home tonight to see me or Derek or Eric and give us a few moments just to open the Bible with them or maybe we can do it later in the week if there's not enough time tonight. And just let them know what the Word says, that they can be sure. Lord, we love you tonight. We bless you for who you are and all that you're doing. In Christ's name, amen. My goodness, so many things here that I was confused about, things I had no clue about. Thank you, Pastor Fred. I can't wait to see what you have for us next week. Well, friends, that's it for now. But don't forget to listen again next time for more truth about our future home in heaven.